Thank you. Had he told me, I'd have come in my vampire form, but I didn't get the warning. Well, first of all, I've got uh, to give Fabian's apologies. I spoke to him late last night, and he, he's got this uh, dreaded man flu, which I've been suffering from as well, but I think I'm recovering a little bit faster than him. So apologies from him. Clearly, I haven't had much time to prepare for today, so do bear with me um, if I ramble a little bit. Um, in choosing the, the, the topic that I'd be uh, dealing with today, I had various thoughts. One of them was to give you a, a series of anecdotes of my experiences with wildlife, almost a la Gerald Durrell, because um, I've got quite a few funny and interesting stories to tell. But I thought that, that, um, that I'd do something else, which perhaps would mean a little bit more to people who are here. So I decided that what I'd do was relate a few of my childhood and other early memories, um, and how I think they may have shaped me, and how what was happening around me when I was very young uh, may have helped to, to shape the Gibraltar that we live in today. I was born a long time ago, uh, and it gets longer and longer every time I say it, um, in 1956. Um, and I grew up in a Gibraltar that was very different to this one. Um, my first phone number that I can remember was 796. Uh, and then I remember the 5796, there's 75796 and so on, but that puts it into context. I remember that in order to go to school, we, uh, my dad had, had a car, um, eventually uh, a lot of other people didn't, and we used to pull these car journeys so we could all get to school in time, the sort of thing that I wish we would do more today. Um, and I remember the first TV, um, we didn't have one, my auntie next door used to have one, and every Saturday afternoon, our highlight would be to go there at four o'clock, uh, all the different brothers and cousins and so on, to watch either Bonanza or El Virginiano, um, which was really, really, really special. Uh, but at a very early age, my interest in wildlife and in nature started. I, I remember uh, going um, along Queensway uh, with my mum. It was our special walk because we used to walk under these eucalyptus trees. They were still there. And I used to love just uh, walking over the leaves and looking up at them. And uh, little did I think uh, at the time that many, many years later, I'd helped create a park there. Um, and it was that, that sort of thing that, that attracted me. I remember walking uh, also to the old glasses, which had lots of very low houses. And they used to have chicken runs. And I used to love going to see the chickens. And there were swallows at the time. Um, and, and I was very, very aware of the wildlife around me. One, one very crucial person in, in, in this development was my great aunt. Sadly, I never met any of my grandmothers, but my great aunt Enriqueta um, was a great lover of wildlife, and um, she would have all these pots full of flowers, freesias and geraniums and so on on our terrace, and she would teach me how to grow them and so on. And that really, and she'd grown up in the countryside um, as a young girl. Uh, over in Spain, of course, because my generation, most of our grandparents, or at least one of our grandparents, would have been Spanish. So she taught me how to appreciate nature and how to be aware of how close nature was around us. And I remember I used to sit on the steps in my house in Irish town, looking across out the window and seeing the swifts flying by and wondering why they weren't here at certain times of year. And I remember the monkey sitting on the roof even then, a long time ago. So, <laughs> yes. It's not my fault. <laughs> um, but there are other things that, that, that really uh, come home when I think of my childhood. One of them was how much more military there was around than there is now. You used to walk the streets and there were soldiers all over the place. And how I used to go a little bit later on when I was at school up in Sacred Heart, the old grammar school, and when the fleet was in, the fleet was in. You could hardly see the water through the number of ships and all the things that used to happen at night as the sailors went out on their drinking uh, forays is something that was also um, quite significant. But one of the, and, and it's, it's something that uh, we're all aware of how the military has stepped down and Gibraltar has evolved, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's one thing that really used to hit me at the time, and that was the amount of land you couldn't go to because it was MOD land. And the signs all over the place, MOD land, keep out. And somehow, even at an early age, and even though I appreciate now the importance of the military to Gibraltar and so on, somehow I resented that. Somehow I felt that there were some other people there keeping me out of my own land. And in a lot of ways, I think that what shaped Gibraltar and what shaped 
uh, how keen Gibraltar is for its own identity and for its own voice is not just the pressure we've had from Spain, but also the fact that for many years we were really a colony, and even within our own land there were places we couldn't go to. I remember every time I used to go up the rock with my dad to the old scout camp, we used to stop and have to get a key from the security police before we were even allowed to the upper rock. And that sort of thing had a certain amount of influence on my life. Remember that this was the days of the Beatles and the days of the hippies, the days of the protest movement. And I remember very, very clearly the protest movement in Gibraltar. I, I grew up with Social Action, this magazine newspaper that used to uh, be produced. I grew up with the Young Christian Worker Movement. My brother, my sister, older than me, were all very active in this world. I mean, the song I used to hear most of, apart from It's a Hard Day's Night from the Beatles, was We Shall Overcome. And even at a young age, I was so inspired by people who stood up for their principles. I remember very, very clearly in the days when Humbert Hernandez and Alfred Cortez went to jail for something they believed in, um, th this, this move against conscription. And whether you agree with conscription or not, now or then, the fact that people were willing to go to jail, willing to, to stand so firm, had a tremendous influence on me. And I always thought, look, uh, if you really feel for something, you've got to speak out and you've got to really stand for it. So those were crucial. I remember watching on the old GBC in black and white, um, on the vigils that they held up in the Moorish Castle, people going there and singing and so on, and that had a really, really profound uh, uh, impression on me. Another thing that I was very conscious of at the, uh, at the time, um, because remember that um, I lived, I was nine, just a day before my 10th birthday uh, was the, the, the referendum. And I remember it clearly. I mean, National Day now we see every year, but to me that was the first time ever that the whole of Gibraltar came out in all these flags. There was more blue than there is now, but that was for good reason. Uh, Gibraltar painted in red, white and blue, everybody, it was a big festival and that, as a nine-year-old, had such an impression, again, really formed the sense of identity that I grew up <coughs> to feel. And then, very few years later, the frontier closed. And to me, at the age of about 13, having gone like everybody used to for the old, odd, uh, we couldn't go too far because it, it wasn't so easy to get across and drive up into Spain. But uh, my aunts used to live in Campamento and I used to go there uh, maybe every uh, two or three times a month for, for, for the afternoon and so on. And then suddenly, this didn't happen anymore. It was okay, I was very lucky. I, I, I'd been involved in the scout movement from a very early age. My father, my grandfather had all been scouts. Uh, and some of you here were scouts with me, I can see. Um, so I had lots of activities, but, and then that's when I developed a bit further my interest in nature. And that's when the knowledge of the environment of Gibraltar, which is now so important in the work that I do today as well, uh, came to be. Because these young people, looking for things to do, started to go out to uh, uh, study nature, and a lot of the things that developed later on in, in Gons and so on, really had their beginnings in the days of the closed frontier. Because those were different days. We didn't have internet, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have anything like that. So we had to create our own activities. And we also became much more conscious of Gibraltar's identity. We had nowhere to go. We used to go round and round the rock in a drive. We used to walk uh, to have a picnic up the rock. And we um, used to have the beaches, which was our only way out um, for pastimes. Then we started to travel much more to the UK. Civil servants got a return trip paid every year. So the links with the UK actually became stronger during those, those years. I remember I used to, I mean, I, I never really missed going to Spain and I never was resentful. But to me, the sense of injustice that we were trapped within this uh, area of land, that we couldn't go out even if we wanted to. If we didn't want to find that surely we had a right in, in a Europe that was developing into the 20th century, we had a right to go out. I, I, I couldn't uh, really understand why I, ha I knew nobody who was Spanish. I grew up without a single friend who was actually Spanish, and yet they were just across uh, the border. I knew that if we had to go up for personal family reasons into Spain, you'd have to get onto the hydrofoil, go all the way to Tanja, all the way to Algeciras, and if we had to go to see my auntie, try and get a bus or a taxi to Campamento, take a whole day, and if the weather was bad in the Straits for Novea, 
when nowadays you could just go across in 10 minutes. And that to me, really, really, I resented that. Um, it, was, it was a Gibraltar which flourished. It was a Gibraltar that really uh, flourished socially. I mean, there were economic problems, but as a youngster, I didn't re realize those, no? But it was a Gibraltar that, to me, was placed in a position which was unfair. And it's all these different things that, that um, I saw happening that gave me the sense of identity. And I think the, 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 the sense of justice that a lot of us in Gibraltar have. And, and, and if one thing to me um, uh, is important is the importance of the close frontier years in shaping Gibraltar. So much so that I remember just before the frontier opened, I think it was 1982, I was not, not so young anymore, I was, I think it was 25, 26, I was actually quite worried. I was actually quite sad because I saw the way Gibraltar had developed, um, the way we were so uh, active in all the different spheres, and somehow there was a glimmer of a threat. The border opening, us being exposed to a Spain we really didn't know, us being exposed to a world we really didn't know, would it threaten Gibraltar? Would the sense of identity that I had grown up to treasure so much fade? Would osmosis, this dreaded word, would osmosis actually take hold and would Gibraltar's identity fizzle out? So worried was I that I actually wore black on the day that the border opened. Uh, it was, yeah, absolutely. It was almost a, a protest, but it, it was a, a funny protest because it was a protest at the fact that the frontier was opening because somebody else wanted it to. And I felt that as Gibraltar, we should be the ones who decided what happened to us, even to the extent of opening the frontier. But I think most clearly that much of what we have in Gibraltar today would just not be the same without the concentration, the focusing, and the resetting of Gibraltar that occurred in the years of the closed frontier. Ironically, it could be one of the few things for which we could genuinely thank Spain. I think I've done it with one minute to spare. Thank you very much.